Good morning, and welcome to the Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And uh, sorry, we were starting a little bit late. We had some IT issues. Uh, we are starting, um, actually continuing on S-254, and relating to recovering damages for Article 11 violations by law enforcement and a report on qualified immunity. And uh, we are starting with our Council. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, Ben Novogrosky from the Office of Legislative Council. I just wanted to briefly um, take an opportunity to just clarify some of my testimony from yesterday and, and one correction. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Lalonde had mentioned um, adding the term remedy to the second prong. Um, and um, I had said that, uh, you know, it was a verbatim recitation. Um, in my haste on the 11th hour amendments um, in the Senate, uh, remedy should be um, a part of that second prong okay. um, as it is part of the case. So I appreciate Representative Alon uh, keeping me honest on that one. And I just wanted to correct it for the record that that was an oversight okay. um, that can be, you know, added. Um, An easy, yeah, easy one, right? Easy one, exactly. <laughs> right, right. Okay, well, no worries. Yeah, yeah. And, and just the second point of clarification, we were talking about what those remedies could be. Um, and uh, in the Zulo case in paragraph 38, there were some remedies that were put forth by the state as being potential, um, you know, remedies to monetary damages, being one being a 1983 action, which we discussed yesterday, another being injunctive relief, um, and in that case, prohibiting the state from stopping vehicles with covered registration stickers or from issuing exit orders um, based on suspicion um, that the driver possessed um, cannabis. Uh, a rule 40, uh, criminal procedure rule 41 motion, um, which provides procedures for search and seizure uh, or seizure of forfeited property, which um, I think this committee has some knowledge of at this point. Um, and then uh, an administrative complaint against the officer or the assertion of rights in a criminal proceeding, such as a motion to suppress. In the case, those were considered to be insufficient because it was a case against the state of Vermont and um, seeking damages. And it went in to say that 1983 is one of the, wouldn't necessarily be um, an alternative uh, remedy uh, because it would be uh, only available against state officials in their individual capacity. And so that in and of itself was, and so for those reasons, those remedies put forth by the state, state were considered insufficient. But in potentially another case, depending on the facts and what's going on, perhaps they could be. But I just wanted to clarify that those were put forth by the state, state in that case were deemed insufficient. Um, and they went on to talk about um, the 1983 remedy and how it interplays against uh, the state or an individual. Great. Thank, thank you so much. Any questions? For so are we talking about page two, number two, there's no meaningful alternative remedy? Ooh, yes, remedy would be... In the context of the particular case. Correct. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll move on to witness. Um, well, actually, before we um, start with our witnesses, I do want to welcome, we have two UVM interns here, so welcome, nice to, nice to see you, and it's a great, great program, I know I'm, better, I'm benefiting from it, I have an intern as well, so, okay, great, so um, start with the Commissioner of Department of Public Safety, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, I think I'm a little backlit here, sorry about that. Uh, I was actually in the building yesterday. Sorry, I missed you uh, this morning. For the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of Public Safety. I think uh, my testimony will be relatively brief, and I'm going to defer uh, to other members of our team um, to uh, provide a little more depth. Um, to begin, I, I just want to emphasize the extent to which uh, both the Department of Public Safety and police professionals around the state are committed to uh, process improvements, modernization, reforms, uh, trust building uh, on a host of uh, different topics and levels. And that is sort of the, the centerpiece of much of the work that's being done uh, operationally on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, with that, however, on the back, as the background, um, we remain opposed to this bill in any form uh, for a, a number of different reasons. Um, you know, beginning with the, the fact that the, the underlying premise here, um, as with a, a number of different things that are, are uh, being debated right now, is a, 
is the premise that law enforcement cannot be trusted. Um, and I think uh, that is both a, a flawed foundation and uh, and one that potentially damages uh, our state as a whole. Um, we're opposed also because this bill singles out uh, a, a very small cross section of government employees for um, enhanced options for litigation. Um, that is not constructive. Uh, we also see the bill as regressive, uh, trying to address things at the back end by creating new avenues of litigation um, or memorializing or attempting to memorialize uh, ways to enhance litigation is is regressive. Uh, we should be investing uh, in great hiring practice and great training, um, good law enforcement executives, um, exceptional policies, and then the process by which you uh, assess the efficacy of all those things and constantly uh, improve them. So for a host of foundational reasons, we remain uh, opposed to the bill. Um, I will let our, on the three components, I'll let our uh, team get into more details. Um, we oppose the, um, the uh, so-called codification of Zulo uh, in large part because that's not exactly what it does, um, uh, but I'll let the team get into more detail. Uh, on the public records uh, component, um, I would offer that I think it actually is a step back from where we are right now. Uh, any settlements or litigation are uh, public uh, on, the, on the government side to include the names of the government employees uh, affected by uh, or targeted by the uh, litigation or settlements. Um, and I think the, the way this is drafted is actually a step backwards in transparency from that. And then finally, um, uh, I'll just make an observation regarding the report that's contemplated here. When we began this debate in earnest um, after a press conference announcement about the original bill uh, back in January, um, we, were we requested and were provided by the Senate a list of cases of concern um, that were uh, purported to be illustrative of the need for uh, changes in the, in the legal landscape here. Uh, we did an in-depth analysis of all those cases. That analysis, uh, a synopsis of that analysis uh, is posted, uh, I believe, to our website, but certainly to Senate Judiciary's website. Um, so the, the, the cornerstone cases, the foundational concerns uh, that were originally indicated, uh, pointed to as a, an indication for the need for this uh, are things that have been um, already looked at. So um, I'll pause there to uh, ask if there are any questions, anything you'd like me to elaborate on, and if not, uh, happy to uh, allow you to move on to the next witness. Um, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. We do have um, at least one question. Uh, and if, so, if one of the other folks on your team is going to address this in greater detail, then that's fine. And you can just pass. I'll just await their testimony. But I was wondering if you could say more about the analysis that um, with regards to the kind of the record you know, keeping requirements here that you think it's a step backwards on the current level of transparency. I'm just would like to understand the mechanics of that analysis a little better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I believe in the last draft that I saw, and, uh, and candidly, this changed about every half hour over the course of uh, a day or so on the Senate side. So it's conceivable that I'm uh, working from some <laughs> other copy. Uh, but um, there appear to be, in the version I'm looking at, protections uh, around um, in, uh, disclosure of certain components of public employee uh, names and things of that nature in the uh, in the bill. And those protections don't exist, nor would we um, expect that the name of a public employee who um, is subject to litigation should be private. Um, it's, it's not now. So uh, that's what I'm getting at. I think it maybe it was realigned since that draft. So now we're talking about the record of 50, 56 await the record of case disposition, I think. Right? And we're, yeah, we're looking at the bill as passed by the Senate. So, um, and I'm sorry I didn't say that when we when we started to get everybody on the same page. But and it says all judgment settlements and their underlying complaints are subject to public disclosure unless an exemption applies pursuant to 1 VSA 
317. So I'm guessing they may have heard some of your concerns and then just really tried to tie this provision to current law. That seems yeah, to be it, the case. But. It, yeah, I appreciate that clarification. Um, I, I would simply observe it that at this stage, then it's redundant and um, it, there's no need to, to uh, add that um, language well, I, to anything because it already exists. I think what we heard from our legislative council yesterday was that while the judgments would be, um, the judgments would be available under current law, the settlements may not always be pub public documents. So I think this brings kind of judgments and settlements into, <clears throat> that was how I understood the tent, intent of this provision during our walkthrough yesterday. Yeah, respectfully, I don't see any exception, um, nor uh, have I ever worked with a lawyer in um, government that has uh, argued for an exception to make a settlement agreement uh, on behalf of, done on behalf of government private. Um, I've never heard of that. Uh, we've never operationalized that in any of the agencies that I've worked in, um, whether they're law enforcement or in the agency of commerce. Um, I'd, I'd respectfully disagree with that analysis. Okay, well, well thanks for speaking to the, to the language where it's at right now. I appreciate it. So thank yeah, thank you. So I, just, I wanna make sure I, I understand your um, testimony based, based on this language, you, you feel that it's unnecessary, it's, it's redundant, doesn't change anything, is that? That's that exactly right. Uh, with, uh, yeah. As you've outlined the final version, uh, the objection simply is it's a duplicate. It's not necessary. Um, uh, settlement agreements on behalf of government are public record now. Um, and uh, are things that historically uh, the media has actually asked for lists of and um, in organizations I've been part of have, have always been provided. Okay. And I, I should note for the record, uh, in municipal government, um, uh, it's probably not universal, but in most instances, uh, the uh, elected legislative body typically has to sign off on uh, payments for these kinds of things. So that is done. Um, you know, votes can't be taken in executive session. So the beyond the fact that the settlement agreement is public, they have to act in public session to vote to uh, be able to settle these kinds of cases. Thank you. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, not seeing any other questions. Um, I don't know if anybody, I, I do see um, Tucker Jones. I don't know if, um, if you wanted to testify or, or add anything. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I have I have some brief testimony. Um, Great, thank you. That, Excellent. That, that I'll provide. So, good morning, uh, representatives. My name is Tucker Jones. I'm an Assistant General Counsel for the Department of Public Safety. Um, so, as you know from Commissioner Sherling, uh, the department uh, does not support uh, this bill as passed by the Senate. Um, the bill does keep this topic of qualified immunity alive in some form and the department does not support the merits of that policy direction. Um, but in addition, specifically in regards to this idea of codifying the Zulo case, um, I believe it's legally unnecessary to do so. And in the way it's formed here, uh, it raises more questions than it answers. Uh, so I originally raised this Zulo case to Senate Judiciary, uh, and I raised it as an example of why courts endorse the principles of qualified immunity. And my understanding is that this case was included in the bill as a compromise, and the purpose of putting this into statute was to make sure that this cause of action applied to all law enforcement officers because the facts of the case dealt with a state trooper. Uh, and in my view, it's unnecessary to do this because courts generally do not distinguish the type of government official who violates a constitutional provision as a matter of law. For example, whether the violator was a state, municipal, or county law enforcement officer is generally irrelevant 
uh, for a finding of a constitutional violation by a government actor in the first place. Rather, it was just the facts of the particular Zulo case that happened to involve one type of government actor. Um, but now in this bill, in putting the Zulo elements into statute, the bill does not say that the cause of action applies to all government actors. Rather, it essentially attempts to limit a constitutional claim under Zulo to just law enforcement officers. So again, typically the courts wouldn't distinguish between the type of government actor for a constitutional claim, but this section 5607 appears to limit those claims to just law enforcement officers. So a question arises about whether other types of government officials could be the subject of a Zulo Article 11 claim anymore under the terms of this bill. Uh, a related question is whether the bill has the effect of abrogating the Zulo decision in whole or in part. Uh, that can happen when the legislature attempts to cover an entire subject matter that used to be addressed only in the common law like this Zulo case. That would become a legal question for the courts and it would raise questions like, for example, whether the legislature is attempting to limit the Zulo Article 11 claim to just law enforcement officers. Um, another issue is on page two, subsection two, and it's already been addressed about the word remedy uh, being mis missing from that subsection. Uh, you know, this is a word from the Zulo case, and I wouldn't want to admit that word because of the quite lengthy analysis of what the word remedy, alternative remedies means in that case. Um, but there is also, in addition to the fact that that word's not in there right now, uh, something of a paradox here, because by creating a new statutory cause of action, the bill is essentially creating a new alternative remedy. And a question arises of whether that affects the meaning of subsection two, at least as it was understood by the court when it authored that case. It just may be another question for the courts trying to figure out what this bill means. Um, so that's that's all my comments on this idea of codifying Zulo. Uh, the commissioner addressed 5608 um, and from the department's understanding, these records are generally public. Um, so it appears that the section essentially states the law as it exists today. Um, and then as for the report called for in section two of the bill, of course, the legislature can ask legislative council to study whatever topic it wants to, um, but I'm not sure whether it's necessary to ask legislative council to do so in formal session law. Uh, an informal request seems to net the same result uh, as contemplated by that section. So these are the extent of uh, my thoughts on S-254 as passed um, by the Senate. And I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee this morning. Thanks for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I just wanted, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I just wanted to ask about your comments and just try to really understand DPS's position on section two, the study, um, because I think I heard the commissioner Say, and maybe even yourself say, um, you know, the TPS's position is that they don't want further study on this because it essentially keeps the the issue alive. And I've paraphrased incorrectly. I apologize, but that's that was my takeaway. But now I'm hearing you say, you know, it's it's more just redundant and unnecessary and we can ask our legislative council to do anything we want but it just doesn't need to be in session law but I, so i just want to get real clarity from the department on their position about this report if possible yeah both i mean we're not saying that the legislature can't inquire itself further i it's that's obviously within the purview of the legislature to work with legislative council on any topic <laughs> once. 
uh, rather just more specifically, I, I don't see a need to necessarily put this type of request in session law. If it were a study that we see in other contexts uh, where it was asking some other entity to engage in some task like the sentencing commission or joint uh, justice oversight, something like that, I, I would understand that would be in session law. But because this is just a request of legislative council to look into a topic, um, I, I, I'm not sure it's needed to be in session law. That's all. I guess I heard two different things, though, and I'm just trying to get clarity on if it's both and or really one or the other. I heard, like, uh, you're, I, I appreciate what you're saying. We could direct legislative council to do any number of investigations for us without having to kind of codify that request in statute. And so it may not be necessary but then i also think i've heard the department say we really would prefer that you don't do further study on this issue and just and just and um and, and don't continue to investigate and do that legal analysis and have that come back to you and i just want to get real clarity on if that's the department's position like don't even talk about this don't study it anymore <laughs> yeah the, 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 it's a it's a both and um so uh, yes, as to the merits, you know, th there was uh, extensive testimony uh, orally and, and in written form uh, um, from the department um, on why we think on the merits of this issue of removing qualified immunity for law enforcement officers in civil court um, is, a, is a bad policy direction to go in. Um, and the merits of that isn't really necessarily before the committee in the form of this bill as it was passed, um, but the um, nothing has changed the department's position on that um, in light of uh, all of the testimony this session so far. So the department continues to oppose any legislation that singles out law enforcement officers to remove that foundational legal protection of qualified immunity in our civil courts. Um, and, and the explanation I won't go into in depth here, but rather just kind of reference the, the merits of that are addressed in on the legislature's website under S-254, but it's under, uh, right now it's under the Senate Judiciary's uh, folder there um, with DPS's overall position on the merits of that. that um, position. Okay, thank you. Um, Barbara and Martin. So, so Tucker, if we were to <clears throat> uh, make changes to the bill and have it apply to all state employees, would that um, be more satisfactory? Obviously, other things would have to change because of Zulo not being pertinent to DCF workers, for example. But but assuming we went back to a model or went to a model that limited um, uh, immunity for all state employees, how would you feel? Well, just to clarify, the Zulo decision didn't limit immunities, specifically qualified immunity to anyone. Um, so that's not, I understand. that's not. I'm just talking about S-254 as a vehicle and whatever that looks like, if it applied to all state employees and not singling out law enforcement. Sure, so at, consistent with what I was saying earlier about how this claim really would apply to all government employees, if you did that, there would still be this secondary question of what the second prong really means in light of the fact that you're putting it into statute um, what, and whether that uh, changes the meaning of what an alternative remedy is in light of the fact that you're creating an alternative remedy by putting it into statute. And, you know, I, I think that this was not um, explored in, in any depth uh, previously. Um, this is really all coming out for the first time now. Um, and 
but there's really a, a threshold issue of whether it's necessary to put any of this in statute to begin with. I, um, I understand. We might. I just wanted to hear your thoughts about law enforcement versus other. <clears throat> the other thing, and I think it was something that the commissioner said, and not you, but um, that we were going from a place of um, not trusting law enforcement can't be trusted. And I guess I'd like us to think about this differently because we don't, we have laws in place obviously for a reason. And if we make the assumption that, so giving qualified immunity or taking away qualified immunity isn't a trust thing as much as an accountability thing in my mind. And I guess I would like to ask you to think about it in terms of like, why wouldn't we hold state employees accountable like we do the private sector? Like why not give everyone qualified immunity and just have a big, we all trust each other. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't make sense to me. I'm not sure what the question is um, that you have. Maybe we could rephrase. Sure. So. Would it make sense to give qualified immunity to the private sector? Um, it's a this bill, but 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 it, I'm just trying to wrap my arms around why qualified immunity is an entitlement somehow. Sure, and so you know, and here we're kind of getting into the merits of the underlying policy uh, to begin with, which I'm happy to do. Um, and we testified to some length uh, about this with the Senate. Um, the logic here goes back quite a bit with the courts, recognizing that we're essentially paying uh, government employees to affect other people's rights, including their constitutional rights. And that's something unique in the public sector. Um, so in particular for law enforcement, for example, we're paying them to uh, affect people's rights to be free uh, from search, from seizure. We're paying law enforcement in particular circumstances to take people against their will into custody um, and um, things of that nature. And so long ago, the courts determined that there must be a balance in place for when someone whose rights have been affected by um, a government official goes to sue that government official for money damages, that they should only be allowed to do that if the government official was on fair notice that their conduct violated that person's constitutional rights. And so over time, the courts created an analysis to determine whether that is the case or not to permit money damages in that circumstance. And um, you know, the Vermont Supreme Court has long recognized that principle. Uh, the U U.S. Supreme Court has long recognized that principle uh, to strike that balance. And the, the question becomes, um, is that the right balance? Uh, is the court reaching fair and balanced outcomes uh, in these cases for money damages uh, against government officials and in this context against law enforcement officers? The department's position um, from the beginning as we looked at the case law in this area, and specifically the Second Circuit case law and the Vermont Supreme Court case law on the application of this doctrine, uh, specifically to law enforcement officers, and especially in the context of the use of force, our conclusion was that the, our courts um, are applying the doctrine in a fair and balanced manner um, to make sure that the government officials are on notice of what conduct constitutes a constitutional violation um, and, and what conduct doesn't. And, and that individuals are being appropriately compensated through the civil liability system um, as it exists today. And so augmentation of that system is not necessary uh, to ensure fair victim compensation in appropriate cases when a government official harms uh, a, a, a person. Um, and so that's, that's the crux of the department's position um, and 
you know, that will not change. Um, I, I don't suspect uh, anytime soon um, in light of our, we've already studied the issue. And so the legislature could study the issue as well, of course, um, but, but we already have, and, and that's the conclusion that we've come to. Thank so, you. Can I just ask one quick follow-up? Yeah, I, I, I do want to keep it to the sort of the four corners of the document that bill is passed by the Senate. But, but go ahead, Barbara, and we'll. So, so Tucker, that your answer just um, supported it just being law enforcement. As a, I know you don't want any of it, but. Your explanation sort of framed in why law enforcement is special and needs the qualified immunity given the ability to hold other people um, against, against their constitutional rights, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, you know what? It's not going to be a short answer. Sorry, I'm going to pass. Thanks. I, I, I can just do a one sentence answer if that's if if, if that's uh, acceptable. Um, sure. Yes. Madam Chair, it, it, yes. my answer was just tailored to the specific topic of eliminating qualified immunity for law enforcement officers specifically. So that's I'm just talking about that particular context. Um, as it relates to other government officials, that that topic wasn't really ever before um, before Senate Judiciary, and we didn't get into into the details of how it affects, for example, DCF workers or others. So I I'm just trying to kind of specifically address how it how it impacts I, the I, litigation. It just, your office mentioned it only being law enforcement. So that's what I was responding to. Thank you. Martin, you? Yeah, um, thank you, Tucker. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the bill, uh, as we've discussed, codifies uh, Zulo, but I had a specific question with respect to the third prong. I, what is your understanding of uh, how Vermont courts interpret uh, clearly established law. And, and uh, Representative Lalonde, you know, I, I think um, I, I didn't watch the testimony yesterday, the walkthrough and your comments, but I think this question came up and, and maybe this is what you're referring to of whether a statutory violation could be a violation of clearly established law um, or not. And one area that this would come up in is the new use of force statutes and whether that could be uh, a clearly established law that an officer could violate. Um, is that kind of the direction that you're? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it also, it's, it's, um, it's been said, and it, it does certainly appear to be the case on the federal court level, uh, that the courts are only looking at judicial precedent to determine if something's clearly established law. And I haven't done the in-depth uh, review of all Vermont cases, but just looking at Zulo, uh, it's a, it doesn't clearly say if they're only looking or should only look at precedent or should they look at other <clears throat> sources of law that could be clearly established. And I wouldn't even leave it just at statutory law. I, I would also suggest, uh, well, I mean, so, just real quickly, put it in context, the Zulo case goes on and says, uh, clearly established rights is one that is sufficiently clear that every reasonable official would have understood that what he is doing violates that right. Now that seems like presumably law enforcement can understand that that's the situation from statute, from policy, or even from training. And, and I guess I'm just wondering if that's, if we're really narrowly looking at it in Vermont courts, or would they look at these other sources to see if the law enforcement officer should have known what the law was? Sure. So, you know, just to step back, this particular Zulo cause of action, it was specifically regarding a violation of Article 11. So that's an element, I believe, of the offense itself, that there has to be a, a violation of Article 11. So if we take it out of that Zulo context, though, there's this other question of whether clearly established law applies to statutes and policy. And it does apply to statutes. Um, and I believe uh, it was even just that the original seminal case, Harlow v. Fitzgerald, that actually said that. 
Um, but, you know, in the context of the Vermont Supreme Court, I think the best example I could give you is a 1994 case called Murray v. Yee. And these cases, so what I did is I went and looked for every Vermont Supreme Court case I could find that addressed qualified immunity and law enforcement. And I compiled them into a table. And that table is, is part of this unified position statement um, that's on the Senate Judiciary's S-254 website. And so that particular case in 1994 the Vermont Supreme Court held that qualified immunity did not apply to an officer who engaged in a high speed pursuit resulting in injuries to others because the doctrine does not extend to situations in which the legislature established a clear duty and liability for a breach of that duty in statute. And that was a reference to the fact that Vermont had at the time and still does a statute governing high, governing emergency vehicles and their ability you know, to exceed the speed limit and things of that nature. And the court specifically said that in that context, and it was law enforcement, um, that that statutory scheme about high-speed pursuits was a statute that um, created a duty and liability, um, and therefore there, that satisfied the clearly established standard. And so QI didn't apply, qualified immunity didn't apply there. And so that's just, a kind of, I think, a good example of you could take that case and then analyze whether the same uh, argument would apply to the use of force laws that you, you passed last year. And it's not been decided yet. It hasn't been analyzed yet by the courts because those statutes were just passed. So it'll take a few years for the court to really analyze that. Um, as it re, as it, so statutes, yes, um, they can affect a clearly established right. Um, as it relates to policy, you know, I, I think the relevant case is Cain v. Lamoth. Um, so that's from 2007. And, and in that case, the Vermont Supreme Court just said, uh, generally internal policies and manuals provide preferred standards, but not legal requirements for which individuals may hold the state liable. Um, and so that's a legal standard that they came up with there that, um, you know, I think you would see people referencing that to say that a policy alone um, does not affect the clearly established standard, um, the analysis under clearly established law. So I think that's how it shakes out um, as far as I, you know, as far as I know. Appreciate the answer. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Could you, I'm sorry, could, would you just tell us what the court case is? You, do you remember how the citation at hand? Sure, sure. That's Kane v. Lamoth. So that's um, 2007 VT 91. And, and that's paragraph 11. Um, and that's kind of cited as a, a, a strong principle for the proposition that policy does not um, does not create kind of a, a, a legal requirement that uh, people can sue under. Um, I, I should mention that um, the federal district courts have, I, I've seen them question whether that is in fact the case. Um, and so I could send, if you're interested in this topic, I, I could send you the um, quotes from, uh, I believe it was Judge Rice in the district court, questioning whether they can really establish a legal requirement from a policy. So it has been questioned by a federal district court in Vermont, but um, as it stands in the Vermont Supreme Court, you know, that, that seems to be the law of the land right now. Thank you. And what was the other, the first case regarding statutes, the citation? Yeah, that was Moray v. Yee, um, and that one was 162 VT 366. And, and I will also just add all of these statutes, or sorry, all of these cases and other interesting cases in this area um, are on pages 16 uh, to 18 
of the depart this unified position statement on the legislature's website. So you could you could find them all there as well. We have it now. Yeah, thank you. We thank you. Yeah, we just posted it to our to our committee page. So yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, there's a lot of things that we're talking about, and I always get buried in like the legalese. So I'm gonna see if I can structure a question here. So I feel like looking at this bill. Looking at uh, these prongs you guys are talking about, and so a law enforcement officer knew or should have known that the officer violated clearly established law. Is what I'm hearing you say that legal precedent currently is that the knew or should have known cannot include, does not include professional policy. So essentially training, professional training. Is that what you're saying? That like being trained in how to engage with the public is not enough of sort of, uh, if they violate that training, that's not enough to, to indicate that um, they should have known otherwise. Yeah, so for money damages suits, uh, generally you need a violation of the constitution or a statute to recover. Um, and And so, in general, that's the state of the law. The policies are really what govern um, what I call HR proceedings, which would be you know agency internal investigations, um, and and also um, likely professional regulation investigations, decisions through the Act Fifty Six process. Policy may impact um, that, um, but in terms of money damages suits. We're really looking at constitutional violations or statutory violations. So I don't know if this is a question for you. Oh, sorry, can I? Um, yeah, and yeah. So I don't know if this is a question for you, but how how then are currently officers learning about what their statutory obligation? Like, I, I guess I'm. Maybe I'll just say that this conversation is leading me to in the direction of feeling like there is further statutory clarity needed. If the policy of training policy isn't enough, then that is concerning to me. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. good. Well, it, just it, if I may, Madam Chair, just briefly, um, as it relates to the use of force standards that the legislature passed last year, those were in statute. Um, and in addition to those uh, statutes, the state did come up with a statewide policy on them, basically elaborating on them. And both the statutes and the policy were trained to all, I believe, all law enforcement officers last year. Wilda White, who's here, uh, did a lot of that training. Um, and and so that that's how it gets, that's how the statutes get conveyed uh, and the obligations under the statutes get conveyed to law enforcement officers is through those types of trainings. Because sure, we put it into law. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's move on to Wilder White. Good morning, Wilder, and welcome. <laughs> uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Chair Grad. Here you are. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Wilda White, I am the uh, founder of an organization called Mad Freedom, which is a uh, civil and human rights advocacy organization uh, whose mission is to end the discrimination and oppression of people based on their perceived mental states. Um, and we have a particular interest in um, this uh, this bill particularly is introduced because in Vermont, um, uh, our our members, our constituents, um, you know, are, are the people who are primarily uh, being killed by, uh, by law enforcement. Um, I think in the last ten years, I've counted eight people who were in mental or emotional distress who have been um, killed by law enforcement, and so we're interested in. Um, obviously uh, uh, not just, you know, being able to sue because, you know, if you're dead, you can't sue, but uh, we're interested in policies um, that prevent um, those, those encounters. 
And, and you know, fundamentally, uh, we don't believe that um, the right to sue, uh, particularly for our community, um, is, is good enough. Um, or in, in, in many ways, we feel that right is illusory because we don't typically have the kinds of access to justice um, where we could even vindicate our rights uh, in the legal system, separate and apart from the existence of qualified immunity. Um, by, by, by education and, and training I, uh, and occupation, I am a, a, a lawyer, a, a trial lawyer, a civil uh, trial lawyer. And when I was practicing law in California, New York, and Massachusetts, I actually um, did sue law enforcement officers for Section 1983 uh, violations, um, and I, I think the experience I uh, gained in that has led me to the position of today that uh, you know litigation does not uh, is not effective in holding quote people accountable, um, and so for for that reason as well i i don't see uh, litigation as a solution to uh, the problems that i see um, uh, with with law enforcement uh, particularly in their interactions with people experiencing mental and emotional distress in terms of the particular bill that you have before you um man freedom is a, is opposed to that bill um and not for the reasons that we were opposed necessarily to the original uh, bill um but um when I look at the three sections of the bills, uh, three section of, of uh, section S of S254 as passed by the Senate, um, I think that uh, in terms of the first section that would that purports to codify Zulo, uh, I don't think it uh, does so. Um, you know, Zulo is the kind of legal decision that you read as a as I read as a lawyer. Um, that makes me really proud of the Vermont Supreme Court. I think it's a, a really good decision, um, really protects the rights of citizens. It's really thoughtful, well-crafted, well-written. And I don't think the codification that you're attempting here does justice to the decision. I think it um, raises a lot more questions than it answers. Uh, and I think uh, Tucker Jones talked about you know, maybe it limits it to law enforcement officers or, you know, I, I think there's a there's some bigger questions uh, as well, because, you know, I, as a lawyer, you're always thinking of scenarios, you know, what could happen. And one that I, when I read the way that the, the Senate has attempted to codify Zulo, um, it limits it to law enforcement and it also defines law enforcement. And so, you know, we live in a state uh, that's border, you know, we have a lot of other states on our borders. And there are oftentimes there are kind of cross-border uh, law enforcement actions. And so you might get a, a Massachusetts state trooper acting in concert with Vermont uh, state police. Um, and that Massachusetts state trooper might violate the rights of a Vermonter under our Article 11. And the way you've codified Zulo here, it's like, well, would a Vermonter be able to sue that uh, Vermont, that's that Massachusetts state trooper, since you've limited kind of law enforcement as it's defined to Vermonters. You know, there's also a provision under Vermont state law where a citizen can make an arrest uh, under a particular circumstance. And in doing so, they would be acting under color of state law. The way you've attempted to codify Zulo here, that raises the question in my mind whether a person who was wrongfully seized by the citizen. Um, who was acting under color of state law would be able to bring a Zulo type um, Article 11 action, given that you've attempted to codify Zulo and limit it to law enforcement officers. And so I think that, you know, I actually saw this bill getting written in the Senate. It was really, and, and to use the words of, you know, Senator Benning, you know, kind of written on the fly. Um, and I feel like if you really wanted to codify Zulo, it, it needs to have a much more um, a rigorous uh, process um, and to make sure that you are not writing a bill that has a lot of unintended consequences and actually limiting the rights of Vermonters uh, to pursue actions, um, which is not something that the Vermont Supreme Court um, 
intended to do by that decision. I also agree with Tucker that um, there's a problem with the sec including the second prong. Even if you wanted to pursue this, um, there's a problem with that second prong. Um, and when I refer to the second prong, when talking about that alternative remedy prong, um, I read Zulo as including that second prong as one of the things that a plaintiff has to prove uh, to pursue an Article 11 action. I include, I read the case as including that second prong only in cases where the legislature has enacted, right? It says, um, we, they, they included it as almost a deferent, in deference to the legislature uh, as, as a, you know, as judicial restraint and deferring to the legislature. So it says the legislature hasn't acted here. And so you have to, in order to pursue this remedy, you have to show that the, there's no legislative alternative, right, remedy. Um, now that the legislature has acted, I feel like if you were going to try to codify Zulo, that the second prong would go away. Um, and so I, I say that all to say that I really think that if you're going to codify Zulo, it needs to be... Um, more carefully crafted and um, a more uh, a, 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 a different kind of deliberative process than that occurred in the Senate, with all due respect to the Senate. Um, in terms of the second uh, section of the bill, the, um, the requirement that law enforcement uh, maintain records of settlements and judgments and those be made public, again, it's already uh, existing practice in law that public records of you know, settlements and judgments by public entities are always uh, public. You can't, you know, in all the years that I was practicing law and I sued um, public entities, you can never enter into a kind of non-disclosure agreement with a public entity. Um, they are, as Commissioner Sherling announced, you know, in municipalities, they, they have to get passed by that governing body and the, the parties, the allegations, the amount paid, that's always public. So when courts are interpreting statutes, you know, they assume that the legislature understands the law um, as it exists and that when they're passing a statute then that another statute in that area, um, the courts assume that you meant something different, right? And so the question is, what do you mean what are you trying to do here? Um, because we are, they're already public. And so the reason I think you would think that you're trying to limit it, because you make this reference to exceptions to the Public Records Act, none of which apply. Um, and so I think that second section creates confusion. Um, I think the second section actually got included in the bill because I provided some testimony in the Senate uh, that looked at how other states have addressed this issue of ending qualified immunity for law enforcement officers. And one of the bills that I brought, one of the uh, statutes that I brought to the committee's attention was how New Mexico did it. And New Mexico has a provision in its uh, Civil Rights Act, which ended qualified immunity for all government uh, officials that requires um, the, a public record of all judgments, settlements, and the complaint. Like, a depository, like in a central place, um, so that uh, you know you didn't have to like go to individual law enforcement agencies or something. It would just be a, a central place where these would be kept, and also so you'd know whether it was being done. Because the way this bill is written, you you have no way of knowing if law enforcement officers are actually you know following the statute. But if you New Mexico required all these to be sent in a central place, and I think that's how they got written. Um, that's that's the genesis of this provision, but I think it the way it was actually written actually confuses um, conf is confusing um, and would raise more questions um, than really um, making the system more transparent because it couldn't actually get more transparent than it currently is. Um, the third issue about the report the report um, I, I you know there's some. There's uh, some language here about uh, that the purpose of the report is to uh, understand the impact of the doctrine of qualified immunity on access to civil justice remedies for people wrongfully harmed by, quote, bad faith policing 
and violations of civil rights in the state of Vermont. When you look at what this report uh, is asking for, I don't think you would ever get that um, information. So I don't think the report is actually reasonably calculated to answer the question that you've posed. I mean, this issue of kind of bad faith policing, I don't even know what um, that any, uh, that's just not an issue that's going to be determined in a case, whether it was bad faith because you know, qualified immunity is not a is, is not based on a good faith. It's an ob objective standard, not a subjective standard. Um, also, I don't know why the bill would limit uh, a, an evaluation of qualified immunity to just law enforcement officers. I would think that you'd want to understand how the doctrine was working uh, in general for everybody. Um, I don't think there's any particular reason for singling out law enforcement when you're looking at qualified immunity. Um, the same disparities that we see in with law enforcement in terms of kind of race and disability, we see in other branches of, of, of government, particularly education, um, you know, people who are disabled, people who are not white or disproportionately suspended from and expelled and punished and, and uh, in public schools by, you know, public school teachers and, um, I would be interested in how qualified immunity is working um, there if you're interested in how it's working uh, in law enforcement. Um, so uh, I think those would be um, my, uh, my comments uh, on, on this bill. And as usual, I'm happy to answer any questions that may arise. Thank you. Thank you, Wilbur. That was, that was really helpful. I appreciate it. I want to go, um, let's see, in terms of the second section, um, to make sure I understand your, your testimony. So it's the, unless an exemption applies, you feel that's, um, that's confusing because that's what I understand you to say that, that there aren't any exemptions that would apply. Is that the language that? Yes, I think, yeah, under current law, um, you know, how I've, I've always uh, in my practice, uh, settlements with, public entities are always public, no exceptions. Settlements, judgments, no exceptions. Um, okay, so the one possibility would be to strike that, to strike that sentence. I'm not, I'm not sure that's gonna change your... Um, well, no, I mean, striking it and also, I mean, it, it, there's no way to enforce it either. It's like, how are you gonna okay. know whether law enforcement agencies are, are keeping this? Yeah, I understand um, that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Right. Yep, Lynn. Well, going back to that same section, I mean, it sounds like I'm just I'm looking at I'm going to look at the um, cross reference because just to the the part that you and Maxine were just talking about, it seems to me that it it's just cross referencing existing exemptions in state law so it's not like creating a new exemption right it's just sort of yeah. putting on the record <clears throat> but actually that was so if you want to comment on that please do in case i've misunderstood something no, I, I, think, I, think, I think that um you know the let, when, when people are when, when courts are trying to construct true statutes, right? That, that if, if there's some question about what they mean, you know, uh, if there, it's not clear on the, on the, on the, on the face, what it means, they, they assume like, okay, the current law is this the legislature knew that current law. And then, so they, they created a new law. And so they must've meant something different, right? Because they couldn't have just, why would they write a new law that says the same thing as the existing law? And so they would be looking for what this new meaning means, right? And so um, they would, I think they could be within their, it, it would be rational to think, okay, to look for what it, so does now the legislature mean like there, there can be exceptions? There are exceptions to, um, to having this be fully, transparent um, and you know, to the public. Uh, so I just think it's confusing um, and, and it's unnecessarily confusing because uh, 
this information is already fully available um, to the public. Well, the, the cross references to the Public Records Act, so it's just saying the exemptions in the Public Records Act apply, right? I think. Yeah, I mean, that's what it says on its face. Um, yes. You know, and, and like I said, I'm reading this as an attorney who's always looking for the, you know, what, what can some other attorneys do with this? Um, you know, right. as a lay person, it may, it may just seem fine. Um, to, to me, it seems, why would you, why would you be creating a, a, this new section in the law that's simply um, for something that already exists? You know, that's, that's how a lawyer will look at it. They must admit something different than 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 the which currently exists, and you know, and they will be searching for what that difference is, and they will be seizing upon that language if they if somebody particularly wants to um, keep something from public view. Um, and I would prefer a statute that keeps nothing from public view. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think we have that statute to begin with. So this is, but anyway, the the my my bigger question for you really was um, because I appreciated very much your example of the um, the kind of more central repository it was created in I think in New Mexico, um, and I'm here just in that first sentence. Yes, it just seems like it's really directing law enforcement agencies to essentially do what they are already required to do under the Public Records Act. <laughs> what, do you think this section of the bill would be improved by charging, whether it's DPS or some other entity, with maintaining that central repository? Because I really appreciated your points about just the kind of transparency and that that kind of more aggregate, like easily available, um, you know, I, I mean, I was served on a city council at times when we did settlements and judgments and to, I believe, Commissioner Sherling's point, much of the meat of that takes place in executive session and, and not all of those documents are, they, they might be public records that people can petition for, but they're not necessarily readily available to the public and the public would have to know that they need to make that request. And so I'm just thinking about the distinction you were talking about between kind of the current state of the law where, yes, it's a public record, but that's, but there's not, there's not that kind of transparent um, repository. And wondering if you think this section would be improved by, um, by trying to create something like that in Vermont. Well, I generally think when you write laws, you should be able to enforce them. And this one, you can't because you will never know if people are doing it. Um, and secondly, I think it would be helpful to, as to Vermonters to have a central uh, repository of judgments and settlements uh, entered into by uh, public officials um, when public officials are sued, not just for law enforcement, but all. It'd be, it'd be great for to have that as a central repository. Yeah, thanks. Um, Martin and, and then Bob. Yeah, just, just real quickly, this wasn't going to be my question, but uh, we may want to consider this in the context of S-250 if we end up having it here or if GovOps, because that's setting up a repository and it could very well be related to, to this. Yeah, so yeah. there may be redundancy already between those bills, but that wasn't my question. I just wanted to flag that. Maybe. Yeah, or in the I'm just writing a note about it in the report. I don't know if that's appropriate, but, anyway, but yeah, thank you. So, um, so the question I had uh, is uh, back to the clearly established law uh, issue, and I appreciated Tucker's answer on that as well. But I I'd like you to, if you could just comment on the what you would perceive as the pros and cons, if you want, or if you can, on, on a on a court actually looking at, uh, for determining clearly established law, looking at policy and training that is occurring. And if you're not prepared to answer that, because that's kind of out of left field somewhat, but I am trying to really probe and understand the scope of how one should establish clearly established law. Well, I think it begins with, um, thank you for the question. Um, it's not out of left field. It's, it's I think it's, it is directly relevant. I think that 
you know, as the doctrine that was created by the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court, um, it, it arises out of Section 1983 litigation, basically, where you can sue for violations of statutory and constitutional rights. Um, and so I think that's, that kind of marks the contours, right? Um, and so you don't, it doesn't say you can sue for violations of policy or violations of training. Um, the, the right itself it, that you can sue for are violations of constitutional rights and statutory rights. And so um, I think you're trying to, um, your question assumes that people have a right to sue for violations of training and violations of policy. Uh, but that's actually not how Section 1983 works. Um, it's, but then if I were to expand your question to say, well, should people have the right to sue if an officer acts um, contrary to the way they were trained or contrary to the way, uh, contrary to a policy? Um, generally, training and policy is based on preserving people's rights, constitutional rights and statutory rights. And so they should be, um, they, 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 sh they should be the same, right? Um, and, then, and then maybe another part of your question is asking, um, is, is if, if an officer were trained to do something, um, you know, that, that protects a right, uh, should there, should, 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 that, should that be considered should that right, because it's all about whether the right itself, right, whether, the, whether they violated a clearly established right, um, it does, can the training provide the knowledge that that right was clearly established? I think that would be really difficult in terms of like proving that. Um, I think the problem with the clearly established uh, standard is really because it's so subjective. Um, that it's not uh, it's not applied uh, evenly by every court. Um, I don't think it's the, the problem is that you that it doesn't include training or policy. I think the problem is is that it it varies by region how it's applied. I don't feel I don't feel really comfortable with that answer because I don't feel it was organized enough. But I think that. Um, <laughs> Well, let me just ask, I mean, let me give you a context and a follow-up, and, and that is you have a statutory right or a constitutional right, uh, and then in training, and po well, policy and then training, uh, you're actually training presumably to certain scenarios, and, and often from, at least in some of the Supreme Court or federal cases, uh, they'll look at what happened, they'll look at the factual situation, they'll say, well, that factual situation hasn't happened before for us to know that a, that a clearly established right was violated in that scenario. But if you look at training, it's possible that folks have been trained to exactly that kind of scenario. So, so it should be seen as, you know, that the officer that was clear, that a reasonable officer who had that training would understand that that scenario and what he or she did violated that right. So that's kind of where my thinking is on, on this. How that yeah, and, I, I, and, I, and that's why I said that the problem with the clearly established standard is really depends on who applies it. Because if you read a second circuit cases, particularly the most recent second circuit, second circuit cases, they don't say that the case has to be exactly the same facts or it has to mirror it. They, there, there's a, the most recent case, I think it's Chamberlain versus City of White Plains. The court itself says, it doesn't have to be the same. It can be a completely novel set of facts um, um, it, for a right to be clearly established. Um, and so I think that's why I think it's the problem is in the application and not so much with the uh, the doct doctrine. But I agree with you that that um, so so my the way I look at it, um, Representative Malone, is that um, the you know, the, tr the that it does, I don't think that, I don't think the law really, I don't really think it is the state of the law that it has to be the identical facts. I think that's how some courts apply it. 
The Second Circuit has said that that's not how they apply it, that it could be a novel set of facts. All right, thank you. I uh, know that Representative Norris had a question, but he's he's not here right now. So um, we're going to take a break. Wilder, are you um, able to, to be with us after the break um, to answer Representative Norris's, Norris's question? Yeah, OK. All right, great. Yes. Um, all right, thank you. Thank you so much. 